G.K. Chesterton in America, a Catholic Review of the Week by G.K. Chesterton. The End of Socialism In discussing the end of socialism, do not let us play with words, or the words will play with us. What is important is not what the word means, but what we mean. The word socialist can be used, in France it is used, as meaning anyone who thinks the whole capitalist system incurably bad and wants some other system of greater economic equality. If that is being a socialist, my brother is still a socialist and I am still a socialist. But if socialism means giving all the means of production and distribution to that group or system, call it what you will, which does control the police and the post office, then I do not believe he is a socialist any more than I am, and I believe that nearly all the ablest socialists are socialists no longer. When brothers are in the House of Commons, apparently it is etiquette for them to disagree in politics but agree in finance. My own family relations are of a more old-fashioned sort. I know less, if possible, of my brother's finances than of my own, but I think I know his convictions, and I think that on this point there is very little between us. What strikes me as queerest about this controversy is this, that the new argument for socialism is exactly the same as the old argument against socialism. When I was a socialist, it was the whole capitalist game to say, you can't have socialism until you've altered human nature. And it was our whole socialist game to explain to the capitalist, with mingled tenderness and truth, that he was a jackass. Because the improvement proposed by the socialist, right or wrong, did not in the least depend on any change in human nature. It depended on an unchangeable fact in human nature, which anybody can find out by dealing a pack of cards. If you wish to distribute pennies, or any other form of property, on an equal system, or any kind of system, you most certainly can do it more rapidly and correctly if you do it from one center. That argument still remains, and is still unanswerably true as far as it goes. But there is a further argument. I take it that the point we raise in the matter is simply this. That cards do not deal themselves. That wages do not distribute themselves. Some person and persons, a small minority at the best, must at least temporarily hold all the wealth and, what is perhaps almost more important, all the special information about the wealth. And the plain query is, can we, knowing what men are, and especially what politicians are, so put our trust in princes or in any child of man? Our present state is doubtless an exceptionally degraded parody of democracy, but have even the healthiest and most active democracies ever been able to control their government quite so promptly and delicately as to prevent it abusing a power so instant and overwhelming? Or what is to prevent the politicians cheating us in a hundred hidden ways, deceiving us about what wages they can afford as they do about what taxes we can afford, bamboozling us with the necessity of vast expenses as they do now about the necessity of vast salaries? What is to prevent the politicians giving us a sham economic equality exactly as they already give us a sham political equality? To this perfectly rational question, the socialists hostile to us reply with the old argument of the anti-socialists, that there must be a change in human nature. They will reply that my brother's politicians are conceived on present-day lines, or as I should say, on human lines. They say that my brother does not see the politico-economic psychic development making a beeline. I dare say he does not. I am glad that no such fatality has befallen my family. It must be a horrid sight. But in somewhat simpler English, the answer evidently means that before we get socialism, we shall somehow get much nicer statesmen to administer socialism. I respect faith wherever I find it, but I really cannot see why the souls of politicians should alone be miraculously saved. Why should I not say that all England be put under martial law, that rapid and efficient system, and then say that soldiers a hundred years hence will not be conceived on present-day lines? I defy anyone to say that he has not known more honest men who have grown old in the army than in Parliament. Why should I not simply say that soldiers will improve as the socialists say that politicians will improve? Only because there happens to be no earthly reason for saying it of either of the two. Is it conceivable that these socialist dupes of progress and evolution do not see that they are walking into the capitalist's jaws? Cannot they see that he has only to answer, I'm glad there will be a politico-economic psychic development. Please let me know. 
When a starry scorn of wealth begins to shine in Mr. Samuel's and Mr. Gluckstein's eyes, I shall know that socialism is coming. When an unworldly wish to waste himself for the poor is seen to be torturing Mr. Austin Chamberlain, I shall give up money myself. Meanwhile, you make a beeline for the factory at four dollars a week. The Hooters going. End of section one. Section two. What was rationalism? There are a number of minor fictions, mere points of punctilio and fashion, which encumber the frank discussion of philosophy and literature. A paper might, on its literary side, do a great deal of good in clearing away the little unnecessary lies. In its more strenuous departments, it should contend against large constructive lies, lies necessary to those who tell them. The man with the brain who organizes labor the firm but conciliatory statesman, the man who is an authority on death or marriage, these men could not do a day's work without telling lies. But the minor fictions, these need the stiffness taken out of them. I tried to take the stiffness out of one of them in a review I wrote recently. In that case, it was the notion that one must always avoid or, more frequently, conceal the act of criticizing a book written by a friend. Would it not be simpler to say, naturally, well, it is likely enough that the sort of man I like would write the sort of book I like, but these are my serious reasons for liking it. Nay, I think a little more casual candor would improve the chances even of the snobbish party press. Even the Official journalists would serve their masters better if they dropped the needless details of fiction, retaining only the large, majestic, essential lies. It surely is not necessary for them to say that every speech of their favorite politician is one of his best, and that the speech of their particular bete noire in politics is one of his worst. Nor is it necessary to state that the former always sits down flushed with victory, and the latter pale and querulous from defeat. A man avowedly writing a romance would be more realistic. Now, there are two more of these stiff pieces of literary etiquette, which I think have become a hypocritical nuisance, and I propose to violate them in this article. One of them is the high and mighty business about never answering criticisms. The other is the tradition that, if you do answer criticisms, you must never own yourself wrong. I will take the case of my little book on Victorian literature. It was subjected by many people to two criticisms, one small, the other large. One mainly true, the other, I think, largely false. To take the small one first, it has been brought to my notice by a critic who wrote to point out that the saying about women being civilized by man is uttered by Sir Austin and not Meredith in his own person. Now, if I thought a sort of thin-skinned obstinacy a part of my dignity, I could answer that there are utterances put into the mouths of characters which nevertheless clearly come from the author. And there would be the jolly old bottomless argument about the story and the moral. And I could have a high old time with the soliloquy and the Greek chorus and the man, Shakespeare, and all the rest of it. I think it far simpler to say that, on reflection, I think this critic, a cleric, is right. And that, Though Meredith did take the view I described, the passage I quoted did not prove it. On the same principle, which surely makes the intercourse of gentlemen of letters somewhat easier, I should agree with part, if not the whole, of the larger criticism offered by my second critic. That concerned with the central citadel, which I called Victorian rationalism, or the Victorian compromise. 
when my critic suggests that I did not sufficiently define this central Victorian thing, I think he is right. When he suggests that it was not there, or did not play the part I give it, I think he is wrong. I think heartily he is wrong, and I care nothing for anything except which of us is right. When he suggests that it was not there, or did not play the part I give it, I give him and the others free leave to say that I am putting into this paper a chapter I forgot to put into my book. Indeed, to be candid once more, I am. I may begin by saying that I do not mean by rationalism the application of reason to phenomena and the acceptance of its verdicts. I mean it about as much as I mean by socialism the art of being sociable. Socialists are far from sociable, but they exist. Rationalists were far from rational, but they once existed. The result of applying reason to phenomena is to discover that they are merely phenomenal. And if that is being a rationalist, I am a rationalist. The rational way of accepting a verdict is to accept it as a decision about certain special phenomena. He would be far from rational, for instance, who should read the verdict, not guilty, as meaning without sin. What rationalism really was, and in some corners still is, is substantially this. It was a premature synthesis. It was not the opening of the house of reason, but the impatient closing of it. It did not open the human head like a new hotel. It shut the human head like a packed bag. I call it the Victorian Compromise, because it put in the bag as many of the old relics and reverences as it could. I call it the Victorian Rationalism, because it was guided in its selection by a very clear but very crude theory. In other words, it planned out the packing scientifically, but it never asked whether the bag was big enough. The result on which I wish specially to insist was this, that this false finality of the reason has behind it a prolonged and increasing torture to the instincts. That is what I mean when I say that Dickens rebelled against it ignorantly and by the light of nature. This was why the war against it was a war of poets, sometimes as irrational as a war of animals. Ever since rationalism became the rule, the mysterious thing called human nature has scratched like a cat in a cupboard. I think the only way I can convey my conviction is by a string of examples. Deepest of all the examples, of course, was that loss of the sense of design of providence, more admitted than expressed, that went with rationalism in its narrower sense. I am not talking about the truth or falsehood of theism, but only about this sense of abnormality and emptiness that went with its loss. The Victorian rationalists were always adopting a compromise because it was comfortable, and keeping it on, though it was more and more uncomfortable. The secular attitude was the strongest case of this. The rationalists found that what they had dropped was not merely some pedantic definition called a personal god, but was the whole of that sense that a man's life means something, that it is acted before a witness and brought to a test, which is the first and most natural thought in the man's mind. Secularly considered, there did not, as Dent Pittman said, seem to be any story in it. I repeat that I am only speaking of the psychological fact of a strain. The atheist had to remind himself that he was an atheist more often, and that is saying a good deal than the Christian that he was a Christian. The current of the blood ran the contrary way. The quick-witted atheist was always saying, Thank God! The slow-witted atheist talked about 
the purposes of nature. I have never questioned that the atheist is heroic. He is heroic because he is ascetic. He can never be wholly human. He has lopped off a limb. But take another and easier case, which I will call the case of beggars. This is where the Manchester School comes in. I agree with one of my critics who suggested that reason itself refuted the Manchester School. I should add that reason itself refuted rationalism. For me, the point is that a definite historical sect, appealing to reason, put an appalling strain on the civilized emotions. It was supposed to be proved in some way that the only lawful way of being philanthropic was to let a man starve in Ham's ditch because there was a job for him in Hull. It was a compromise, for even the miserable Malthus dared not denounce all charity, but said alms should be given very sparingly. But it was a rationalist compromise because it went against the instincts in the name of an indirect piece of demonstration. And it was a cruel compromise, not only to the poor man who could not get a penny, but to the rich man who could not give one. The good Victorian walked the street in a torture of embarrassment, ashamed of giving money and ashamed of not giving it. Third case, the case of soldiers. Here again, it was supposed to have been proved that military glory was a gory superstition, that peace achieved by commerce was a nobler thing. And here again, the Victorian mind could not keep it up, except as a kind of compromise. Thackeray was a very typical Victorian, and he wrote a ballad called The Chronicle of the Drum. It is followed by an epilogue that seems meant as an antidote. In this he says that war is very despicable, really, and soldiers only know the art of cutting throats. But the note is false. The strain is evident. The strain of the Christian telling himself he is a Quaker. For no one who really despised war could have written the Chronicle of the Drum at all. The Case of Ghosts of fairies and similar things. In every Victorian home there was a kind of permanent crisis of concealment about the existence of the supernatural. Everyone had to pretend to believe in Santa Claus because no one could simply say that he believed or disbelieved in St. Nicholas. And the strange result has been that the old rational mind has narrowed and hardened, while the more modern mystical mind has freed itself. Every respectable nurse tells every respectable baby that there are no such things as ghosts. And all the time the most subtle and advanced intellects, from Mr. Henry James to Mr. Algernon Blackwood, are always writing that there are. Lastly, I touch later and more perilous ground, but I think the suffragettes are the last orgy of rationalism. A man honestly admiring them feels a pain in the head. He is fighting with nature. He has to tell himself again and again that his aged mother carried under a policeman's arm is a citizen. That sex has nothing to do with it. That ridicule proves nothing. That self-sacrifice proves much. But all the time his subconsciousness goes on repeating like a refrain, I don't like my mother under a policeman's arm. I don't like it. I don't. I don't. I don't. That is what I mean by rationalism. That hasty and false simplification of the findings of reason from which our time awoke as from a daydream, only to find that the poor man had a hole in his stomach and the rich man a hole in his head. The rationalist was pursued by enemies, blind but strong. The most terrible enemies a man has, the things he has forgotten. G.K. Chesterton 
End of section two. Section three. The return of pageantry. Though still in an eclipse of economic slavery and desolate irreligion, there is some real sign that the English-speaking people may again become a gay and poetical race, as they were in the Middle Ages. I have always thought that the English coronation service might not unworthily be called the last and greatest of the pageants, but we do not, unfortunately, have coronation services frequently enough to enliven our dull lives. It is in other directions that we must look for changes, and it so happens that certain celebrations have really shown the culmination of a change in the English people, a change which is widespread, profound, and, I think, historic. The outbreak of those earnest and archaeological fancy dress balls of recent years all over England, and I hear all over America as well, was largely spontaneous and was extremely astonishing. For nearly two hundred years, the whole trend of the English had been in the direction of despising symbolic sentiments and rococo festivals, and telling everybody to stick to mutton-chop whiskers and to mutton-chops. We looked lovingly on the shapes of our own policemen, merely because they were ugly, and we regarded the mildest gendarme at a foreign railway station as a sabred brigand. This view was not only general, but genuine, deep, native, and sincere. The merchants and farmers who felt it were far more English than the young England dandies, or the mountebanks who tried to interfere with it. Yet it is being abandoned now, not by dandies or mountebanks, but seemingly by the genuine British public, and its adoption and its abandonment are equally subtle enigmas of history. Why did we ever have this shyness about dressing up, and why are we losing it? I have a notion of my own, which I fear brings in controversial issues, as most real things will, and I think it worth while to outline it. I can outline it in one sentence. The night is still about us, but Puritanism has died in the night. The Puritans, in their hours of pride, seem actually to claim that the English peoples, in whatever land, are fundamentally Puritan, were made by the Puritan spirit. They put Cromwell in the place of Alfred. They put him not merely at the head of English patriotism, but at the beginning of English history. They make old England a sort of Puritan colony, like New England. All this, of course, is a ludicrous delusion. The first facts, or names, that jump to the mind will remind anyone that England had a splendid national literature and a very unmistakable type of national life before the hat of a single Puritan had been seen and hooted in England. Chaucer is even more English than Bunyan. Shakespeare is certainly more English than Milton. The Tabard and the Mermaid, Lady Godiva and St. George, Robin Goodfellow and Robin Hood, belong to a national tradition that has not even been touched by Puritanism, yet which is quite different from the tradition of Spain, of Scotland, or of France. Chaucer's Franklin, whose beard was white as a daisy, and whose house it snowed meat and drink, was as certainly an Englishman as he most certainly was not a Puritan. Puritanism was something put into the English people after they had grown to their full national stature. Some hated it as an alien poison. Some praised it as a violent medicine. But nobody pretended that it was the natural bread and ale that had hitherto built up the countrymen of Colette and Ben Jonson. It might indeed be maintained that in all the three cases of nations thus raided by Puritanism, the Scotch, the English, and the Dutch, this religion has been rather a sort of spell or possession than a true change of personality. It might be suggested that in each case a merrier and more medieval nation went alive into the land of bondage and is now coming alive out of it. Thus the Scotch romance and witchery which Scott and Stevenson have brought to life is only the return of a spirit most marked 
in the old Scottish ballads and chronicles, in the tales of Tinlane in the forest, and Thomas the Rhymer among the fairies, and in that almost Arthurian romance of the roving court of Robert Bruce, which left, like a gypsy blood for generations, a tradition of wandering Scotch kings. Even in Scotland, I believe, Calvinism has only been an episode. The Scotch are taking off their blacks and appearing again in the purple of their ancient poetry. We may yet hear the twang of the last precentor before we really hear the lay of the last minstrel. Even in the third case of Holland, of which I know far less, something of the same kind could be suggested. Before the coming of the Puritan, the people of the flat country had already shown that talent for a certain detail and domesticity in art which fills so many galleries with their quaint interiors and their convincing still life it might well be maintained that the same note of half-religious realism of an almost mystical silence and solidity is being sounded in much of the new literature of the netherlands nothing could be more like the almost conventional quietude and neatness of the pre-reformation art among the flemings and nothing certainly could be more unlike the somewhat vulgar yet really demonic energy the curious mixture of bourgeois smugness and visionary anarchy that marked the mighty days of the puritan nothing could be further from the new tone in dutch literature than the sensational art and literature of the protestant extremists as you may see it in the old bibles or illustrations of bunyan an atmosphere at once monstrous and prosaic mixed of a mild view of this world and a mad view of the other the earth an endless london suburb like clapham and the sky a permanent apocalypse it left on the mind a confused sense that angels had whiskers and saints had top hats and certainly the dull energy in it was at the opposite extreme from the spirit of a small room as described by the belgian poet for heron were painted by mending but the case of england at least admits of no mistake not only did england produce a most anti-puritan literature before the puritans existed but it went on under the puritans and in spite of the puritans producing literature quite anti-puritan there is as little that is puritan about fielding and dickens as there is about chaucer and shakespeare Dickens quite obviously existed to champion everything that the Puritans existed to destroy. When Mr. Scrooge is converted to Christmas, Cromwell or Ireton would have thought that Scrooge was relapsing and not repenting. When Scrooge and his clerk sit down to a bowl of smoking bishop, the Puritan would have been equally disgusted with the spirit and with the name. Nevertheless, the Ironside element, though alien to England, was to a certain extent mixed with it, and I myself believe that it is to this partial mingling of a foreign and a native idea that we owe the curious attitude of the English peoples, until lately, towards processions, religious and secular, pomps and historical pageants, nothing else will explain this phenomenon so well. The Calvinist color, mixing with each separate national color, made in each case a different blend or tint. The Scotch had been restless, rebellious, fond of mystery, valiant, and sometimes cruel. The combination of Calvinism with this produced a sort of somber romanticism, which one can feel very strongly in Burns, and in the blacker tales of Stevenson. The Dutch, I imagine, were domestic and devout. The combination of Calvinism with this produced a slight dullness and a rage for keeping things clean. The English certainly were lusty, casual, and full of broad fun. The combination of Calvinism with this produced a curious kind of bourgeois embarrassment, part humor, part respectability, and part good sense. Since the Englishman was not to wear crimson clothes carelessly, the next most English thing was to wear black clothes casually and unobtrusively, where the Catholic Englishman had been modest enough to make a fool of himself the protestant englishman had only that lower sort of modesty that will not make a show of itself he objected to making a pageant because it is literally speaking making a scene it is said that the frenchman shrugs his shoulders 
but the victorian englishman was born with his shoulders shrugged his whole attitude until lately has been what's the good of making a fuss it is a sensible and pleasant temper it is the remains of the real englishman who gave its patient pickwickian cheerfulness to the canterbury pilgrimage but it will be gained and not lost if this minor humility of drab and gray can give place to that higher and more humble humility which can forget itself in flowers and fireworks and in the colors of the carnival g k chesterton end of section three high priests of the unutterable whenever you hear much of things being unutterable and indefinable and impalpable and unnameable and subtly indescribable then elevate your aristocratic nose toward heaven and scent the smell of decay it is perfectly true that there is something in all good things that is beyond all speech or figure of speech but it is also true that there is in all good things a perpetual desire for expression and concrete embodiment and though the attempt to embody it is always inadequate the attempt is always made if the idea does not seek to be the word the chances are that it is an evil idea thus giotto and fra angelico would have at once admitted theologically that god was too good to be painted but they would always try to paint him and they felt very rightly that representing him as a rather quaint old man with a gold crown and a white beard like a king of the elves was less profane than resisting the sacred impulse to express him in some way that is why the christian world is full of gaudy pictures and twisted statues which seem to many refined persons more blasphemous than the secret volumes of an atheist the trend of good is always toward incarnation but on the other hand those refined thinkers who worship the devil whether in the swamps of jamaica or in the salons of paris always insist upon the shapelessness the wordlessness the unutterable character of the abomination they call him the horror of emptiness as did the black witch in robert louis stevenson's dynamiter they worship him as the unspeakable name as the unbearable silence they think of him as the void in the heart of the whirlpool the cloud on the brain of the maniac the toppling turrets of vertigo or the endless corridors of nightmare it was the christians who gave satan a grotesque and energetic outline with the sharp horns and spiked tail it was the saints who drew the devil as comic and even lively the satanists never drew him at all and as it is with moral good and evil so it is also with mental clarity and mental confusion there is one very valid test by which we may separate genuine if perverse and unbalanced originality and revolt from mere impudent innovation and bluff the man who really thinks he has an idea will always try to explain that idea the charlatan who has no idea will always confine himself to explaining that it is much too subtle to be explained the first idea may very well be very outre or specialist it may really be very difficult to express to ordinary people but because the man is trying to express it it is most probable that there is something in it after all the honest man is he who is always trying to utter the unutterable to describe the indescribable but the quack lives not by plunging into mystery but by refusing to come out of it perhaps this distinction is most comically plain in the case of the thing called art and the people called art critics it is obvious that an attractive landscape or a living face can only half express the holy cunning that has made them what they are it is equally obvious that a landscape painter expresses only half of the landscape a portrait painter only half of the person they are lucky if they express so much and again it is more obvious that any literary description of the pictures can only express half of them and that the less important half still it does express something the thread is not broken that connects god with nature or nature with men or men with critics 
the Mona Lisa was in some respects, not all, I fancy, what God meant her to be. Leonardo's picture was, in some respects, like the lady, and Walter Pater's rich description was, in some respects, like the picture. Thus we come to the consoling reflection that even literature, in the last resort, can express something other than its own unhappy self. Now the modern critic is a humbug because he professes to be entirely inarticulate. Speech is his whole business, and he boasts of being speechless. Before Botticelli he is mute. But if there is any good in Botticelli, for there is much good and much evil too, it is emphatically the critic's business to explain it, to translate it from terms of painting into terms of diction. Of course the rendering will be inadequate, but so is Botticelli. It is a fact that he would be the first to admit but anything which has been intelligently received can at least be intelligently suggested. Pater does suggest an intelligent cause for the cadaverous colouring of Botticelli's Venus rising from the sea. Ruskin does suggest an intelligent motive for Turner destroying forests and falsifying landscapes. These two great critics were far too fastidious for my taste. They urged to excess the idea that a sense of art was a sort of secret to be patiently taught and slowly learned. Still they thought it could be taught, they thought it could be learned. They constrained themselves, with considerable creative fatigue, to find the exact adjective which might parallel in English prose what had been done in Italian painting. The same is true of Whistler and R. A. M. Stevenson and many others in the exposition of Velasquez. They had something to say about the pictures. They knew it was unworthy of the pictures, but they said it. Now the eulogists of the latest artistic insanities, Cubism, Mr. Picasso, and so forth, are eulogists and nothing else. They are not critics, least of all creative critics. They do not attempt to translate beauty into language. They merely tell you that it is untranslatable that is, unutterable, indefinable, indescribable, impalpable, ineffable, and all the rest of it. The cloud is their banner. They cry to chaos and to old night. They circulate a piece of paper on which Mr. Picasso has had the misfortune to upset the ink and tried to dry it with his boots, and they seek to terrify democracy by the good old anti-democratic muddlements that the public does not understand these things, that the likes of us cannot dare to question the dark decisions of our lords. I venture to suggest that we resist all this rubbish by the very simple test mentioned above. If there were anything intelligent in such art, something of it at least could be made intelligible in literature. Man is made with one head, not with two or three. No criticism of Rembrandt is as good as Rembrandt, but it can be so written as to make a man go back and look at his picture. If there is a curious and fantastic art, it is the business of the art critics to create a curious and fantastic literary expression for it, inferior to it, doubtless, but still akin to it. If they cannot do this, as they cannot, if there is nothing in their eulogies, as there is nothing except eulogy, then they are quacks or the high priests of the unutterable, if the art critics can say nothing about the artists except that they are good, it is because the artists are bad. They can explain nothing because they have found nothing, and they have found nothing because there is nothing to be found. End of section number four. Section five. The Mummers. One night, about five years ago, I heard a burst of musical voices so close that they might as well have been inside the house instead of outside. So I asked the singers inside, hoping that they might then seem farther away. Then I realized that they were the Christmas mummers who come every year in country parts to enact the rather rigid fragments of the old Christmas play of St. George the Turkish Knight, and the very venal doctor. I will not describe it. It is indescribable, but I will describe my parallel as it passed. 
one could see something of that half-failure that haunts our artistic revivals of medieval dances, carols, or Bethlehem plays. There are elements in all that has come to us from the more morally simple society of the Middle Ages, elements which moderns, even when they are medievalists, find hard to understand and even harder to imitate. The first is the primary idea of mummery itself. If you will observe a child just able to walk, you will see that his first idea is not to dress up as anybody, but to dress up. Afterwards, of course, the idea of being the king or Uncle William will leap into his mind. But it is generally suggested by the hat that he has already let fall over his nose from far deeper motives. Tommy does not assume the hat primarily because it is Uncle William's hat, but because it is not Tommy's hat. It is a ritual investiture and is akin to those gorgon masks that stiffened the dances of Greece or those towering mitres that came from the mysteries of Persia. For the essence of such ritual is a profound paradox, the concealment of the personality combined with the exaggeration of the person. The man performing a rite seeks to be at once invisible and conspicuous. It is a part of that divine madness which all other creatures wonder at in man, that he alone parades this pomp of obliteration and anonymity. Man is not, perhaps, the only creature who disguises himself. Beasts and birds may perhaps take the colors of their environment. That is not in order to be watched, but in order not to be watched. It is not the formalism of rejoicing, but the formlessness of fear. It is not so with men, whose nature is the unnatural. Ancient Britons did not stain themselves blue because they lived in blue forests, nor did Georgian bow and bells powder their hair to match an arctic landscape. The Britons were not dressing up as kingfishers, nor the bow pretending to be polar bears. Nay, some naturalists believe that modern ladies paint their faces a bright mauve with the idea of escaping notice. So merrymakers, or mummers, adopt their costumes to heighten and exaggerate their own bodily presence and identity, not to sink it, primarily speaking, in another identity. It is not acting, that comparatively low profession, comparatively, I mean, it is mummery, and as that ardent anti-ritualist Mr. Kensett would have said, all elaborate religious ritual is mummery. That is, it is a noble conception of making man something other and more than himself, when he stands at the limit of human things. It is only careful faddists and feeble philosophers who want to wear no clothes, and be natural in their revels. Natural men, really vigorous and exultant men, want to wear more and more clothes when they are reveling. They want worlds of waistcoats and forests of trousers and pagodas of top hats toppling up to the stars. Thus it is with the lingering mummers. If our more refined revivers of miracle plays, or Maurice dances, try to reconstruct the old mummer's play of St. George and the Turkish Knight, I do not see why they do not. They would think at once of picturesque and appropriate dresses. St. George's Panoply would be pictured from the best books of armor and blazonry. The Turkish Knight's arms and ornaments would be traced from the finest Saracenic arabesques. When my garden door opened on that Christmas Eve, and St. George of Cappadocia and England entered, the appearance of that champion was slightly different. His face was energetically blacked all over with soot, above which he wore an aged and very tall top hat. He wore his shirt outside his coat like a surplice, and he flourished a thick umbrella. Now do not, do not begin to talk the genteel modern drivel about ignorance, or suppose that the mummer in question, who is a very pleasant rat-catcher with a tenor voice, or suppose, I say, 
that my friend the mummer dressed like this because he knew no better do not be yourself so deplorably ignorant as not to realize that even a rat catcher knows st george of england was not black and did not kill the dragon with an umbrella the rat catcher is not under this delusion any more than paul veronese thought that very good men have luminous rings round their heads any more than the pope thinks that christ washed the feet of the twelve in a cathedral any more than the duke of norfolk thinks the lions on a tabard are like the lions at the zoo these things are denaturized because they are symbols because the extraordinary occasion must hide or even disfigure the ordinary people black faces were to medieval mummeries what carved masks were to greek plays it was called to being vizarded my rat catcher is not sufficiently arrogant to suppose for a moment that he looks like st george but he is sufficiently humble to be convinced that if he looks so little like himself as he can he will be on the right road this is the soul of mumming the ostentatious secrecy of men in disguise there are of course other medieval elements in it which are also difficult to explain to the fastidious medievalists of to-day there is for instance a certain output of violence into the void it can best be described as a raging thirst to knock men down without the faintest desire to hurt them all the rhymes with the old ring have the trick of turning on everything in which the rhymesters most sincerely believed merely for the pleasure of blowing off steam in startling yet careless phrases when tennyson says that king arthur drew all the petty princedoms round him and made a realm and ruled his grave royalism is quite modern many medievals outside the medieval republics believed in monarchy as solemnly as tennyson for that older verse when good king arthur ruled this land he was a goodly king he stole three pecks of barley meal to make a bag pudding it is far more arthurian than anything in the idols of the king there are other elements especially the sacred thing that can perhaps be called an anachronism all that to us is anachronism was to medievals merely eternity but the main excellence of the mumming play lies still i think in its uproarious secrecy if we cannot hide our hearts in healthy darkness at least we can hide our faces in healthy darkness if we cannot escape like a philosopher into the forest at least you can carry the forest with you like a jack in the green it is well to walk under universal ensigns and there is an old tale of a tyrant to whom a walking forest was the witness of doom that indeed is the very intensity of the notion a masked man is ominous but who shall face a mob of masks g k chesterton end of section five section six the thrift of thought i am sufficiently ignorant to be in no danger from the trivial tyranny of derivations even those stray ones which unaccountably stuck to me at school are unlikely to mislead i do not admit that tragedy means playing the goat we do not use oysters to ostracize people in modern society but if anything for the opposite purpose but there are some words of which the derivative sense though hackneyed is still really relevant and one of them is the greek word economy indeed there is no necessity to go to the greek word for the deeper meaning the plain english word thrift contains in itself the contradiction to its own misuse the word thrift is just now and this is particularly true of course among the english very much thrown about and is of course especially thrown at the poor yet before we have the right to say to the poor be thrifty we should have the power to say to them thrive it is a commonplace of course that shakespeare actually uses the word in its positive sense of prosperity where thrift may follow fawning 
and the accidental word contains the case against our capitalist society. With us this positive thrift does follow fawning, and does not follow anything else. It does not, with us, follow independence, the opposite of fawning, as it does in the peasant countries. The poor Englishman, the poor American, the poor North German may grow rich as servant of somebody, either by obeying or betraying him. He cannot grow rich as the master of something, even so much as a scrap of earth. He has no real motive to save anything except his job, that is, the favor of the jobber. He naturally takes his pleasure in a hand-to-mouth style, for he does not know when he will suddenly cease to be a hand and become only a mouth. You may put this truth gravely by saying that when a man lends money to himself, it must be a productive loan. Or you may put it more playfully in the manner of Mr. Guppy's friends and say, but what's the good of living cheap when you've got no money? You might as well live dear. Or you can say, as I say, take to pieces the word economy. It all amounts to the truth that if you want the poor wage earner to practice housekeeping, you must give him a house. He cannot live in a money box. But when we praise the independence of those European peasantries which are now the one wall across Christendom against socialism and the servile state, and when we disparage in comparison the fawning, the snobbery and slavery of our industrialism, we are often too narrowly understood. It is imagined that when we have no human ideal beyond the hard or stern type which in some individuals or some environments accompanies that independence. Here, however, there is a confusion of thought. We certainly decline to keep most men in misery for fear some of them should be misers. We have denounced the philanthropist when he refused the poor property on the ground that they would waste it. We may surely denounce him as much if he refuses them property on the ground that they will not waste it. He has grown inconsistent rather than we, we the believers in the independence and virility of peasantries. But the state will be no more reckless in distributing farms because some farmers will be stingy than the farmer is in scattering seed because some of it falls on stony ground. Spiritually, the French, the Russian, and the Italian peasants differ from one another, and an English or American farmer would differ from them all, to say nothing of the million individual differences among the saints, poets, tribunes, and patriotic leaders who have been by origin peasants. In short, economic independence only allows a man to be a miser as it allows him to be a mystic. That is, it allows him to be a man, and whatever he chooses. Now what may be called the mystical education of peasants is a matter for religion and not for any political or economic arrangements. But in itself it is a thing as telescopic and interminable as the wildest progressive could desire. Well-distributed property has never prevented peasants from being enthusiasts for new religions. It only prevents their being what is called in Ireland, I believe, supers, converts by bribery or the terrorism of hunger. I quite agree that this moral and artistic side of the peasant problem is as interesting as it is infinite, and it is this which I am for the moment considering. Now, what interests me in the matter is this, that the rules of thought are essentially the rules of thrift. I mean that the best way of taking stock of one's philosophic and artistic estate is analogous to the best way of so dealing with a real estate, especially a small one. It permits of the same terminology, and is troubled with the same errors. When we expect a peasant 
to make the best of a field, we do not mean he should put up with it like a prison. That is not making the best of it, but only accepting the worst. We mean that his thrift thrives, that his land, so to speak, enlarges inward, that, like a cup in a fairy tale, it holds more and more without overflowing. And the same intensive cultivation can be encouraged in the thought and even in the fancy. Almost the first thing that attracted me to the medieval mind was precisely what seems to have repelled some five generations from it. I mean the question of how many angels could dance on the point of a needle. For after all, the whole point of a needle is its point. It is the mathematical mystery of its infinite smallness that makes it particularly sharp, so that it can trace out the largest tapestries. And there have been needles, and peasants' needles at that, which have actually produced their angels from their points, which have made vast angels visible with purple and peacock plumage and glories of sanguine and gold. Anyhow, I prefer the mystic's query of how many such rich angels can stand on a needle to the manufacturer's boast of how many poor devils must drudge to make one. There may be something mystical, there is certainly something mysterious, in a form of economy which is practiced by the most luxurious. We have all noticed four or five clubmen smoking cigars that cost a shilling apiece and carefully passing from one to the other a flaming match which costs some inconceivable fraction of a farthing, displaying the dexterity of Houdin and something of the courage of Chevola in their efforts to preserve alight that tiny piece of stick. But I fear they do not truly realize themselves as priests of an immemorial fire-worship, though sometimes the very match is called a vesta, to remind them that they are invoking virgin Rome and the goddess of the guarded flame. They have lost the trick of that fiery thrift, which delivers a tradition from hand to hand like a match. Could we hope that the club men saw any holy meaning in the match, we should expect them to treat it, even after it was extinguished, with less levity. And if the rest of the rite were at all proportioned to their solemnity in this particular, the ashes of the cigars themselves ought to be preserved in ancestral urns. The thing is, I fear, an accident, but the intensive cultivator of the mind, were he in the place of the clubman, would find in such an accident a hint and it is precisely here that the clubmen can make so much less of the match than the mystic can make of the needle. For the mightiest pleasures of the imagination are all made out of hints, and there are as many hints in a small house as in a large one. Generally speaking, the rich cannot take hints. That kind of man, in that kind of club, might have everything from his club to his cigar very big and solid before he can see it. He cannot do the expede herculem, or reconstruct leviathan from a bone. Even his wildness is due to his tameness, to his lack of imagination. Fashionable people generally have to make a thing a fact before they can even indulge it as a fancy. They insist on dizzy speed and distance in motoring to find something which the high philosopher can find by sliding down the banisters. They are really extravagant in expenditure because they cannot be extravagant in thought. The neo-pagan poets of my boyhood used in their poems to praise as demigods such despots as Nero, who burnt cities, marshaled gladiators, or generally painted the town red. But I think that the very fact that such things could be put into poems proves that they need not have been put into practice. 
apart from somewhat graver objections which I entertain to such experiments, I will maintain that those who did them were dull people, and did them because they were dull people. So American millionaires, the dullest and least freakish people on earth, give the freak dinners. That is, the rich man's dinner consists of one joke, where a poor man's dinner consists of a hundred. All art is a kind of gigantic gesture, but an hour in a free man's life consists of a hundred such symbolic gestures which he would not be at the pains to perpetuate any more than he would turn every figure of speech into a figure of marble. For instance, I have always sympathized with one of those heathen tyrants above mentioned, Tarkin, I think, when he indicated his political ideals by striking with his scepter at some tall poppies and beheading them at a blow, but that he should afterwards put himself to the trouble of laboriously decapitating real people in priggish fulfillment of his program, this seems to me an anticlimax and one of those sequels that so seldom sustained the first level of a work of art. I have often relished the full artistic enjoyment of Tarkin on a country walk, appearing in all his kingly terrors to a thistle, and all the good he got out of his scepter can be got out of a walking stick. And if Nero did set Rome on fire for mere artistry, it was because he had never really sat, as one might imagine, Alfred sitting, seeing all the red cities to be seen in a peasant's fire. G. K. Chesterton End of Section 6 Spring and the Story of God The only two things that can satisfy the soul are a person and a story and even a story must be about a person. There are indeed very voluptuous appetites and enjoyments in mere abstractions, like mathematics, logic, or chess. But these mere pleasures of the mind are like mere pleasures of the body. That is, they are mere pleasures, though they may be gigantic pleasures. They can never by a mere increase of themselves amount to happiness. A man just about to be hanged may enjoy his breakfast, especially if it is his favorite breakfast, and in the same way he may enjoy an argument with the chaplain about heresy, especially if it is his favorite heresy. But whether he can enjoy either of them does not depend on either of them. It depends upon his spiritual attitude towards a subsequent event, and that event is really interesting to the soul, because it is the end of a story, and as some hold the end of the person. Now it is this simple truth, which, like many others, is too simple for our scientists to see. This is where they go wrong, not only about true religion, but about false religions, too, so that their account of mythology is more mythical than the myth itself. I do not confine myself to saying that they are quite incorrect when they state, for instance, that Christ was a legend of dying and reviving vegetation, like Adonis or Persephone. I say that even if Adonis were a god of vegetation, they have got the whole notion of him wrong. Nobody, to begin with, is sufficiently interested in decaying vegetables as such, to make any particular mystery or disguise about them, and certainly not enough to disguise them under the image of a very handsome young man, which is a vastly more interesting thing. If Adonis was connected with the fall of leaves in autumn, and the return of flowers in spring, the process of thought was quite different. It is a process of thought that springs up spontaneously in all children and young artists. It springs up spontaneously in all healthy societies. It is very difficult to explain in a diseased society. It is something like this. Men, looking suddenly at spring flowers, have a poignant sense of being at once intoxicated and unsatisfied a feeling only to be expressed in the words, What is it all about? What is that shining mystery which is called the beauty of this world? Who did it? Why did they do it? And what are they going to do next? What shall I do about it? What does it all mean? 
the vegetation considered as a process, man could in almost any age have explained simply as a process. He knew lots of processes, bodily, domestic, utilitarian, which worked like clockwork, and to which he never attached any sanctity. What demanded explanation was not the process, but his interest in the process. The wordless emotions that mastered him at the sight of certain things, and not of others. It was not so much a question of a certain system in the world as a certain spell laid upon him, and it may be noted that travelers and missioners, the most sagacious and the most superficial, all report that in barbaric tribes the minimum of religion is always a belief in the charm or witchcraft of certain creatures and things. It was not the opening of the flowers that the man wanted explained, but the opening of his own heart when he saw them. Religion did not begin in botany, but in something far higher. There are a number of excellent people called agnostics, now probably numbering the majority of the most educated and influential class in society, who sincerely say that the soul does ask this passionate and personal question, but that there is no answer. I am not arguing with these people, not just now. I merely record what the responsible among them will all admit, that in heroic states of youth or simplicity, the question is always asked often in subjective opinion, answered, and that whenever it can be said to be answered, it is always answered in one way. The soul is satisfied. The soul can be satisfied only by something involving a person or a story. Any explanation is good enough for grass, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. But only one explanation is good enough for the beauty of grass. It is the explanation that springs to the lips of every good savage, of every good poet, and, I may add, of every good theologian. It is a god. Then comes the next great leap of the liberated soul, which the scientist cannot comprehend. The fascination of the flowers, when once it has touched the soul, demands a story and a person. The moment the person is believed in, he turns ten thousand times bigger than the flowers or even the story. He does what nothing but a person can do. He explains. The baffling beauty which called him forth as an hypothesis becomes his mere adjunct and ornament. As the simple person sees it, the flowers were but a few hints that there was a story. And now the story has begun. For the soul cares no more for primroses than Disraeli did. It cares for the story of the spring because it is a detective story. A child does not look at the lustrous latticework of the frost and say, This can only be explained on the hypothesis that a man called Jack Frost does it with his finger. He feels that such feathery exactitude suggests the finger of somebody, and as he is not allowed in the best regulated modern families to say that it is the finger of God, he says it is Jack Frost or any one else he happens to have heard of. The process, which remains perfectly direct and prompt, is the passage from the idea of beauty to the idea of personality. Art cries out for an artist. It is plainly impossible that so standard a work as the universe should remain anonymous. But when a child has thought of Jack Frost, he thinks more of Jack Frost than of the Frost itself. The pattern only excites but the person satisfies. By the end of the business, the child has begun to feel that Jack Frost has rather honored the windows by drawing on them at all. He is superior to windows, superior even to winter. He is what no dead things can be. He is in a story. As these children think about winter, so have all the children of men always thought about autumn and spring. If all this beauty meant purpose, the purpose took the first place. If not, the beauty was hardly even beautiful. If the flowers meant a god, they were flung at the feet of the god. If they did not mean a god, they were flung away. End of Section 7 Section 8 Mysticism and a Wooden Post Black Knight had shut in my house and garden, with shutters first of slate and then of ebony, I was making my way indoors by the fiery square of the lamplit window when I thought I saw something new sticking out of the ground. 
and bent over to look at it. In so doing, I knocked my head against a post and saw stars. Stars of the seventh heaven. Stars of the secret and supreme firmament. For it did truly seem, as the pain lessened, but before the pain had wholly passed, as though I saw written in an astral alphabet on the darkness something that I had never understood so clearly before. A truth about the mystics which I have half known all my life. I shall not be able to put the idea together again with the words upon this page, for these queer moods of clearness are always fugitive, but I will try. The post is still there, but the stars in the brain are fading. When I was young, I wrote a lot of little poems, mostly about the beauty and necessity of wonder, which was a genuine feeling with me, as it is still, the power of seeing plain things and landscapes in a kind of sunlight of surprise, the power of jumping at the sight of a bird as at a winged bullet, the power of being brought to a standstill by a tree as by a gesture of a gigantic hand. In short, the power of running one's head against a post poetically is one which varies in different people and which I can say without conceit is part of my own human nature. It is not a power which indicates any artistic strength, still less any spiritual exaltation. Men who write very much better poetry than I are quite without it. Men who are religious, in a sense too sublime for me to conceive, are equally without it. Of the pebble in the pathway, of the twig on the hedge, it may truly be said that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things and have not seen them. It is a small and special gift, but an innocent one. As my little poems were mostly bad poems, they attracted a certain amount of attention among modern artists and critics. I was told that I was a mystic and found myself being introduced to rows and rows of mystics, most of them much older and wiser than I. Of course, there were professional quacks and amateur asses among them, but not in much larger proportion than would have appeared among politicians and men of science or any other mixed convention. There was the long-faced elderly man who said in a deep bass voice, like distant thunder, what we want is love, which is true enough if to want means to lack. There was the little radiant man who radiated all his fingers outward and cried, heaven is here, it is now, as if he were selling something, as he probably was. There was the chippy little man who took one confidentially into a corner and said quietly, there is no true difference between good and bad. They are alike leading us upwards. He was easily disposed of merely by asking, but if there is no difference between good and bad, what was the difference between up and down? But it would be gravely and grossly unjust to suggest that any of these were representative of the modern mystics whose acquaintance I made. I met many men whom history and literature will rightly remember. I met the man who was and is by far the greatest poet who has written in English in decades. For I will not call Mr. Yeats an English poet. I will only say that I should be sorry to see him translated into any other language. I met a man like Mr. Herbert Burroughs, who, almost alone among men in my knowledge, contrived to combine an oriental and impersonal religion with that hard-fighting and hot magnanimity which we in the West mean when we are speaking of a man. There were great poets and great fighters then, among these modern mystics whom I met, and their genius and sincerity, as well as their mysticism, led me to conclude that they were quite right. And yet there was something inside me telling me, with what I can only call a stifled scream, that they were quite wrong. It was the same, for that matter, with my early economic options. I was a socialist in my youth, because the attacks on socialism, as then conducted, left a man no choice but to be a socialist or a scoundrel, as a young American friend of mine once excellently put it. But even then, long before I had ceased to be a socialist, long before I heard of peasant proprietorship or any other escape from our present disgrace, I had felt by a tug in my bones that the Fabians and the Marxians were pulling the world one way when I wanted it to go the other. So I felt about great mystics like Mr. Yeats, about sane theosophists like Mr. Burroughs. I felt not merely that their mysticism was different from mine, but that their mysticism was in flat contradiction to mine, more even than the materialists. I went on feeling this. It took me a long time to give it even an obscure expression. I never found a really vivid expression until I knocked my head against the post. The expression that leapt to my lips then, I am, I say, forgetting slowly. Now what I found finally about our contemporary mystics is this. When they said that a wooden post was wonderful, a point on which we all agreed, I hope, they meant that they could make something wonderful out of it by thinking about it. Dream, there is no truth, said Mr. Yeats, but in your heart. The modern mystic looked for the post, not outside in the garden, but inside in the mirror of his mind. But the mind of the modern mystic, like a dandy's dressing room, was entirely made of mirrors. 
thus glass repeated glass like doors opening inwards forever, till one could hardly see that inmost chamber of unreality where the post made its last appearance, and as the mirrors of the modern mystic's mind are mostly curved, and many of them cracked, the post in the ultimate reflection looked like all sorts of things, a water spout, the tree of knowledge, the sea serpent standing upright, a twisted column of the new natural architecture, and so on. Hence we have Picasso and a million other puerilities. But I was never interested in mirrors. That is, I was never interested in my own reflection, or reflections. I am interested in wooden posts, which do startle me like miracles. I am interested in the post that stands waiting outside my door to hit me over the head, like a giant's club in a fairy tale. All my mental doors open outward into a world I have not made. My last door of liberty opens upon a world of sun and solid things, of objective adventures, the post in the garden, the thing I could neither create nor expect, strong plain daylight on stiff upstanding wood. It is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. When the modern mystics said they liked to see a post, they meant they liked to imagine it. They were better poets than I, and they imagined it as soon as they saw it. For, as I have already described, I might feel it before I saw it. To me, the post is wonderful because it is there. There, whether I like it or not. I was struck silly by a post, but if I were struck blind by a thunderbolt, the post would still be there, the substance of things not seen. For the amazing thing about the universe is that it exists. Not that we can discuss its existence. All real spirituality is a testimony to this world as much as the other. The material universe does exist. The cosmos still quivers to its topmost star from that great kick that Mr. Johnson gave the stone when he defied Berkeley. The kick was not philosophy, but it was religion. Now the mystics around me had not this lively faith that things are fantasies because they are facts. They wanted, as all magicians did, to control the elements. To be the cosmos. They wanted the stars to be their omnipresent eyes, for instance, and therefore they favored twilight, and all the dim and borderland mediums in which one thing melts into another, in which a man can be as large as nature and, what is worse, as impersonal as nature. But I never was properly impressed with the mysticism of twilight, but rather by the riddle of daylight, as huge and staring as the Sphinx. I felt it in bare big buildings against blue high houses, gutted and still, empty great blank walls, washed with warm light as with a monstrous brush. One seemed to have come to the back of everything, and everything had that strange and high indifference that belongs only to things that are. You see, I have not said what I meant, but if you admit that my head and the post are equally wonderful, I give you leave to say that they are equally wooden. G. K. Chesterton End of section 8 The Slime from the Dragon there are walking about the earth at the present day two distinguished gentlemen. They have nothing whatever to do with each other. They have probably never clapped eyes on each other, quite possibly never heard of each other. They are of different generations, different social atmospheres, utterly different interests. If they have realized each other at all, nothing would give them more exquisite agony than to be classed together. I propose, therefore, to do so, and I propose to prove that these two eminent gentlemen, though they are under the illusion that they have never met, are, as a matter of fact, constantly conspiring together, plotting the destruction of Christian Europe. The first one of the conspirators is the Anglican Dean Inge of St. Paul's Cathedral, London. The second, Mr. Lawrence Binion, that admirable poet. Mr. Binion's case is the more interesting, yet I find Dean Inge's the more puzzling. Dr. Inge appears to have said in a recent sermon that Western democracy is rushing upon destruction because some races of the extreme Orient will do much more work and ask much less wages than the poorer citizens of our civilization. This is true enough, of course, and there does not seem to be much difficulty about the matter. Men of the Far East will submit to very low wages for the same reason that they will submit to the punishment known as lee or slicing, for the same reason that they will praise polygamy and suicide, for the same reason that they serve their temples with prostitutes for priests. They do it, that is, because they are heathens, men with traditions different from ours about the limits of endurance and the gestures of self-respect. They may be very much better than we are in hundreds of other ways, and I can quite understand a man, though hardly an Anglican dean, 
really preferring their historic virtues to those of Christendom. A man may perhaps feel more comfortable among his Asiatic coolies than among his European comrades, and as Anglicans are allowed the broadest thought in the Church of England, Dr. Inge has as much right to his heresy as anybody else. It is true that, as Dr. Inge says, there are numberless Orientals who do a great deal of work for very little money, and it is most undoubtedly true that there are several high-placed and prosperous Europeans who like to get their work done and yet pay as little as possible for it. But I cannot make out why, with his enthusiasm for heathen habits and traditions, the dean should wish to spread in the East the ideas which he has found so dreadfully upsetting in the West. If some thousand years of paganism had produced the patience and industry which Dean Inge admires, and if some thousand years of Christianity had produced the sentimentality and sensationalism which he regrets, the obvious deduction is that Dean Inge would be much happier if he were a heathen Chinese. Instead of supporting Christian missions to Korea and Japan, he ought to be at the head of the great mission for converting the English to Taoism or Buddhism. There, his passion for the moral beauties of paganism would have free and natural play. His style would improve, his mind would begin slowly to clear, and he would be free from all sorts of little irritating scrupulosities which must hamper even the most conservative Christian in his full praise of sweating and the sack. His profession and predilections are hardly consistent. In Christendom he will never find rest. The perpetual public criticism and public change which is the note of all our history springs from a certain spirit far too deep to be defined it is deeper than democracy nay it may often appear to be anti-democratic for it may often be the special defence of a minority or an individual it will often leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost it will often risk the state itself to right a single wrong and do justice though the heavens fall. Its highest expression is not even in the formula that all men are created free and equal. Its highest expression is rather in the formula of the peasant who said that a man's a man for that. If there were but one slave in England, and if he did all the work while the rest of us made merry, this spirit that is in us would still cry aloud to God night and day whether or not this spirit was produced by a creed which postulates a humanized god and personal immortality it works by that creed men must not be busy merely like a swarm or even happy merely like a herd it is not the question of men but a man a man's meals may be poor but they must not be bestial there must always be that about the meal which permits of its comparison to something holy a man's bed may be hard, but it must not be abject or unclean. There must always be about the bed something of the decency of the deathbed. This is the spirit that makes the Christian poor begin their terrible murmur whenever there is a turn of prices or a deadlock of toil that threatens them with vagabondage or pauperization. And we cannot encourage Dean Inge with any hope that this spirit can be cast out. Christendom will continue to suffer all the disadvantages of being Christian. It is Dean Inge who must be gently but firmly altered. He has absent-mindedly strayed into the wrong continent and creed. I advise him to rid himself of it. Enter the second conspirator. I have already mentioned that my quarrel with Mr. Binion is not only as black as my quarrel with Dean Inge, it is the same quarrel. They are both engaged in praising the East and praising it for the same wrong reason. Dean Inge has put his praise into a sermon. Mr. Binion has put his into a book, The Flight of the Dragon, which I have just finished reading. For the truth is that no one could ever have come to talking such heathen nonsense as Dr. Inge talks if he were not subconsciously but substantially supported by a great mass of modern culture and the modern spirit which backs him up is the spirit with which our best artists will flirt from time to time, as Mr. Binion does. That oriental idea of universality, which is really negation of everything which is the nothing. Says Mr. Binion, Nothing hurts, for nothing matters. And again, 
separateness is death union with all forms of energy true life to which i can only reply with decision nay violence that separateness is life i shall have union with all forms of energy when i begin to rot pestilence which is one form of energy may come out of my corpse to blast mankind i can prevent it coming while i am separate and have a soul of course i think i shall have a soul after death but we need not go into that just now the immediate point is this that only because our artists play with the eastern notion of the extinction of all desire is it possible for unhappy anglican deans to play with the eastern idea of the approximate extinction of wages no priest would have dared to praise oriental slavery until the poets had begun to praise oriental pessimism i know all about the dragon whose flight mr binion justly admires i know that it is a vast gorgeous and graceful dragon i know it wishes to absorb us all into itself like most dragons but i do not like the dragon i would rather wait for st george in the section nine don't there are a number of people going about today asseverating that morality should always be positive and seldom if ever negative how it can be either without being both is beyond my narrow medieval mind but it is in practice rather than in theory that the notion is generally praised it is specifically urged in connection with education and we are told to offer a child the affirmative ideal and never the negative commandment commonly attached to it. Thus, we must not forbid Arthur to pull his uncle's nose. We should rather expatiate upon the beauty of the nose in its unpulled state, posed like an unplucked flower, and our eulogy should leave to be inferred the improbability of the nose, even in the most skillful hands being moulded into a fairer thing we must refrain from telling oswald in so many words that he is not to stay in the dining-room we must rather exclaim in a sort of abstracted rapture how magnificent how magnetic is the wallpaper in the back bedroom how impossible it must be for the ardent and young spirits to resist rushing upstairs this minute to look at it we must not say sharply gwendolen cease from playing the piano with the fire shovel we must merely observe in loud voice heard above the din how noble is silence older than the gods how it would fill this chamber with its ancient absolution if by any chance gwendolen were to leave off playing the piano with the fire shovel i don't know whether these people really apply their principle in such cases but this is the principle which they profess to apply the superficial logical objection if such people cared even about superficial logic would presumably be that this avoidance of negation is itself a negation a veto upon all vetoes it amounts to saying thou shalt not say shalt not which is rather close to a contradiction in terms nor as i have faintly suggested above would the change be freer from entanglement in practice than it is in theory a gentleman and father of a family who had to go through life without saying the word no would be in as hampered a state as the young lady in the song who was allowed to say nothing else but indeed there is a much broader objection to this kind of argument and to many other similar modern arguments much more serious and influential than this the truth is that this praise of the positive against the negative is not only an ignoring of justice but it would be a very serious curtailment of liberty intending to be much broader than the old vetoes it would be in strict practice much narrower for the disadvantage in offering an ideal instead of a command is that the one is compelled to choose one ideal and exclude everything else whereas in the case of the command we do in the very act of the command 
permit everything else. The uncle objects to having his nose pulled, and that has to be stopped. But it does not follow that he wants his nose praised. He may be shy about his nose, or he may be good-natured about it and quite ready to have it painted a bright blue. Or he may be seriously discontented with his nose and delighted for one happy hour to wear a false one from a toy shop. Or it is barely possible that he may think it rude and personal to talk about his nose at all. All these roads are open. All these temperaments can be satisfied if once we have established the clear preliminary statement, thou shalt not pull. If we have to offer Oswald a positive alternative to the dining room, we can only select some other room if we are to give him a vivid and fascinating vision of it. We must urge him to go to the back bedroom, while the soul of Oswald himself may pant to be in the schoolroom, or in the pink music room, or in the coal cellar. And the whole house might have been open to that happy child if we had simply told him to clear out. If we must not denounce the noisy fire shovel, we can only pray silence and attempt to impose it. But silence is not the only alternative. Gwendolen playing the piano, not with the fire shovel, but with some other instrument, might appear a pretty and soothing influence to her elders. She might say her piece, practice her scales, or do a thousand other popular and sociable things. The method would resolve itself into putting pressure on the child to do one thing, instead of leaving it free to do all things except one. I do not suggest that my distinction is to be taken universally and literally. It would not be strictly true to say that the inscription in a small tea shop, smoking prohibited, actually means that golfing, bathing, and the discharge of firearms and the game of leapfrog are not prohibited. It would be an exaggeration to say that no dogs admitted is tantamount to saying that tigers, whales, and snakes would be admitted. But such a veto, when selected, does generally mean that most other ordinary and likely things may be done. The negative command is a declaration of liberty. Anyhow, it is a boundless prairie of emancipation compared with the other theory of always offering one attractive alternative. For that ties down every man at the very moment when he most needs to be decisive and personal. It may be arbitrary and invidious to put your foot down, but it is a vast deal more uncomfortable to keep your foot in the air. The new principle of positive morality is a mere exaggeration of negation. It is only adding an eleventh commandment, Thou shalt not command. In the old romances, it was the villain that was monotonous. In the old melodramas, it was the villain who always looked the same. His black moustache, eyeglass, and cigarette were a sort of uniform of the infernal service. But the good men were all conceivable shapes and colors, and some were rather inconceivable. Don Quixote was a good man and starved himself. Mr. Pickwick was a good man and did not object to milk punch. Sam Weller was a good man and did not object to pretty housemaids. And Master of Ravenswood was a good man and got drowned. Benedict is a good man in Much Ado About Nothing, and so is the friar in Romeo and Juliet. The old masters maintain the gayest miscellaneousness in good men by having one black stick to represent bad men. It was like the patches that their ladies put upon their complexions. The one black spot threw out and set free all the changing colors and contours of real health. But today we are drifting to the opposite extreme. We are getting only one kind of good man, one who approves of international peace, one who is quite in favor of social reform, one who thinks there should be a minimum wage, but also a court of arbitration. Enough, you know him. 
and we have got around us on the other hand every antic and extravagance of evil men varieties which none of the old romancers could have conceived or would have been permitted to describe i confess that i prefer the old-time notice-boards warning men off particular precipices and swamps in what is in other respects a rolling and romantic land of liberty g k chesterton end of section 10 if don quixote came back no one can understand history who does not enjoy anachronism it is the most human thing in the most human of sciences the camaraderie of the ages and a divine indifference to time patron saints or heroes defy the zeitgeist that rickety old pantaloon thus if a ballad speaks of saint dustin or robin hood going to the court of king arthur it means not so much that they were alive then as that they are alive still but this is specially so of the shifting and dateless age of chivalry it was not so much that knight errantry was ever done as that other things were done in the spirit of it chivalry filled the heads of even unchivalrous people doing unchivalrous things much as a vague socialist utopia of health pure water and public gardens fills the modern mind in birmingham or better say though in mere material fact the streets smell and the property is tied tighter than a miser's that glimmering forest emerald or ebony in which we see the knight-errant wandering was an enduring background it was not so much a vanished custom as a permanent possibility in the same way we find shrewd ambitious men like robert bruce or henry bolingbroke haunted by a crusade on which they never went so that in all their battlefields there was a strange mirage of palestine so in the ballads and romances we are always finding saracens and turkish knights in the most improbable places comfortably established in flanders or playing a prolonged visit to the orkneys it was the sense that chivalry the christian adventure was everywhere if only as a potentiality it is urged in the bab ballads that masterpiece of modern rationalism that in turkey as your paps aware red indians are extremely rare but if one of the unluckiest of the crusading ships which had a habit of turning up in the wrong place occasionally had by a slight miscalculation struck america and the red indians we may be pretty sure that they would have found some turks this chivalric vision was an exaggeration of good and not of bad things on the whole still it was an exaggeration and therefore became in its time a mere nuisance the renaissance which was an interest in the real world found its conventional forests as tiresome as tapestries it broke the beautifully blazoned windows and looked out upon the street lawgivers in new and rational politics had no use for the knight-errant the man who could only champion law by being a sort of outlaw real new countries of red and yellow men of gold and silver mountains were more exciting to the intellect than the prince of muscovoy delivering the daughter of the king of ireland it will not be denied that the breaking point the point where the modern world broke away laughing from the lost medievalism the symbolic act and moment was don quixote now i want to ask here as clearly as i can what many will think a curious question i concede at once that cervantes and his contemporaries were justified in regarding don quixote as a more or less lovable lunatic in a world increasingly sane 
I want to ask whether, if Don Quixote returned today with the same wild ways of knight errantry, it would not rather be the knight errant that was sensible and the world all around him that was crazy? The poor knight's mockers were in the morning of the modern world. For them, a more solid science. For them, a more subtle statecraft. Not merely growing, but promising things. It was sane enough in them to say that Caesar and Hannibal were better worth reading about than Amadis of Gaul. That making a gun was as soldiery as breaking a lance. That mere random personal romanticism was more likely to ruin than redress. It was true then. At any rate, it looked true then. It is not true now. It does not even look true to anyone who can open his eyes on that modern, rationalistic world that the Renaissance has founded. The rationalistic world has turned out much more irrational than the Dark Ages. The Shavian idolatry of Caesar as the Superman is much more fantastic than the boyish praise of courage and Amavis of Gaul. The nations have found more nonsense and nightmare in the build of guns than they ever did in the breaking of lances. If a medieval knight, such as the Black Prince, rose from his grave and looked around at our institutions, he would call us more cracked than Don Quixote, and he would tell the cold truth. Suppose the Black Prince asked what had become of the trade guilds. He would immediately be invited to dinner with the worshipful company of greengrocers, which he would find to consist almost entirely of aged and gluttonous colonels, spruce financiers, junior partners in entirely different businesses, and dreary bachelors living on private means. The eye of that Plantagenet would roll over crowds of them without seeing a greengrocer or one who had ever known a greengrocer. He would think such a gathering more grotesque than a gargoyle. Or suppose, as seems more likely, the prince turned his attention to modern knighthood. Suppose he expected Sir Thomas Lipton to watch his armor all night in the chapel of his order. Suppose he attempted to joust with Sir Edward Grey. Suppose he really required Sir Edward Carson to win his spurs. When he really learned what modern knighthood is, he would ask, with great simplicity and violence, why in the name of the devil and St. Dustin we gave a man military rank and hit him with a drawn sword if swords had nothing to do with it. There would be no jest for Cervantes and a knight fighting a barber when so many baser trades are knighted and never fight anyone. But there is a madder element in our world than this mere misfit of names and things. There is real delusion, deeper and darker than poor Quixote's. Take, for example, the most famous of his chivalrous failures, the affair of the windmills. Quixote is crazy because he thinks the windmills are alive and evil. Well, we are crazy for the same reason. We also think the windmills are alive and evil. Whenever we talk of machinery demanding this or creating that, whenever we say that it is the fault of machinery or that machinery has come to stay, whenever we talk, as we most madly talk, about industrial clockwork as something that cannot be altered, but about marriage, liberty, or the love of progeny as something that might be altered. We suffer more than the stray delusion of the dawn. We are making mills into ogres, the real old nursery ogres that grind men's bones to make their bread. We are seeing windmills a-whirl with our own madness and alive with our own sins. The only difference is a somewhat important one. Don Quixote attacked windmills, but we run away from them. But above all, 
The return of Kiyotri would be the return of sanity for this reason, that the knight errant is suited to a lawless age, and this is a lawless age. Take another of the misadventures of the misguided Spaniard. If I remember right, he attempts to free a gang of convicts under the impression that they were captive youths and maidens led away by bandits. Now, what is the real implication of this rationalistic satire? What is the difference between the convict and a gang and the captives in a bandit's castle? Cervantes knew too much of life not to know that there are good men among convicts and bad men among wardens, and that bandits do not confine themselves to capturing virtuous persons. Convicts are not mere captives, because convicts are convict, that is, convicted of something and sentenced to something. The point of the incident is the folly of casual justice compared with the possibilities of systematic public justice that can really clear up quarrels and fix public penalties. A man sent to prison may serve a long and cruel sentence, but a legal sentence is like a grammatical sentence. It should have a full stop. Even if you hang a man, you cannot extend his sentence. A man captured by bandits might, in comparison, have quite a pleasant time. Certainly, I would much rather live in a cave with Rob Roy than in a reformatory with a lot of police doctors and detectives. There is only one objection to being in a cave with Rob Roy, and that is that he keeps you there as long as he likes. There is the same objection to make of the modern prisons. If Don Quixote stormed a modern jail with shield and spear, he would be apt to find a number of citizens kept there exactly as his own romantic robbers would keep them, under intermittent sentence and according to their own taste and fancy. Quixote's attempts to avenge personally a purely personal apprehension would not be inappropriate now. By the Roman law of old Spain and Europe, he made a mistake. In modern England or America, he would be making no mistake. End of section 11 On Losing One's Head When I was a little boy, I had an imagination, though this has long been washed away out of me by the wordy abstractions of politics and journalism, for imagination, real imagination, is never a vague thing of vistas. Real imagination is always materialistic, for imagination consists of images, generally graven images. There is a mad literalism about imagination, and when I had it I turned everything that anyone mentioned into a concrete body and a staring shape. Thus, I would hear grown-up people using ordinary proverbs and figures of speech, pale, worn-out proverbs, battered and colourless figures of speech. But every one of these phrases sprang out for me as fierce and vivid as a motto written in fireworks. For some reason I had a particularly graphic visual concept in the case of nautical metaphors. Thus when I heard that my uncle, on a sea voyage, had got his sea legs, I pictured the most horrible bodily transformations in my uncle. Had my uncle now got four legs? Or had it been necessary for his two original and, to my eyes, unobjectionable legs to be amputated by the ship's doctor? Did the new legs arrive as a sort of extra luggage, or did they loathsomely grow upon him with an awful unnaturalness of nature? I pictured my uncle's sea legs as two green and glistening members, covered with scales like fishes, and bearing some resemblance to the two fishy tails with which exuberant Renaissance artists provided tritons and mermaids. Again when I heard, in some such seafaring connection, that the captain kept his weather eye open, I assumed with faultless infantile logic that he kept the other one quite shut, and in some dreams I pictured the captain's weather eye as being some separate and eccentric kind of eye, uh, like that of a cyclops, 
an eye of blue sky or lightning that opened suddenly in his hat or his coattails and blazed through black fantastic tempests, a strange star of the storm. But there were many cases, even among more terrestrial and commonplace metaphors, where the material metaphor photographed itself on my fancy. One of them was the phrase about a man losing his heart. A man, considered as a material envelope, seemed so securely done up that how the heart could get out of the body was a problem analogous to that of how the apple could get into the dumpling. Perhaps, I am mused, the phrase about a man having his heart in his mouth might throw some light on the somewhat odd method of its accomplishment, but that again was darkened with doubt by the other phrase which spoke of a man with his heart in his boots, where there was clearly no thoroughfare. From this my childish taste turned into a certain relief to the easier and more popular taste of a man losing his head, which seemed the sort of thing that might happen to anybody. Indeed, by this dream of symbolic decapitation, I was much haunted in infancy, and am not infrequently inspired and comforted even to this day. Whatever other metaphors may mean, this metaphor of the lost head has some primary and poetic meaning, and I have written many bad poems, bad fairy tales, and bad apologues in my industrious attempt to find it out and declare it. The connection between the animal and intellectual meaning of it became close and even confused. I vaguely thought of Charles I having lost his head equally in both senses, which was not perhaps wholly untrue. When I read of the miracle of Saint-Denis, who carried his head in his hand, it seemed to me quite a soothing and graceful proceeding. Saint-Denis did not lose his head, he carried it in his hand so as not to lose it. And indeed, this drifting and dancing dream of decapitation, in which saints and kings figured with gothic fantasticality, had a kind of allegory in the core of it. The separation of body and head is a sort of symbol of that separation of body and soul, which is made by all the heresies and the sophistries which are the nightmares of the mind. The mere materialist is a body that has lost its head. The mere spiritualist is a head that has mislaid its body. Under the same symbol can be found the old distinction between the sinner and the heretic, about which theology has uttered many paradoxes, more profitable to study than some modern people fancy. For there is one kind of man who takes off his head and throws it in the gutter, who dethrones and forgets the reason that should be his ruler and witness, and the horrible headless body strides away over cities and sanctuaries breaking them down and treading them into mire and mud. He is the criminal, but there is another figure equally sinister and strange. This man forgets his body, with all its instinctive honesties and recurrent sanities and laws of God. He leaves his body working in the fields like a slave, and the head goes away to think alone. The head, detached and dehumanized, thinks faster and faster like a clock gone mad, it is never heated by any generous blood, never softened by any healthy fatigue, never checked or warned by any of the terrible toxins of instinct. The head thinks because it cannot do anything else, because it cannot feel or doubt or know. This man is the heretic, and in this way all the heresies were made. The anarchist goes off his head, and the sophist off his body. I will not renew the old dispute about which is the worse amputation but I should recommend the prudent reader to avoid either. End of section 12 The Question of Mary and Happy In the dark house of infancy, I can still darkly trace the outline of an aged member of my family, more than one of whose phrases have lingered in the later generations. In his creed and atmosphere, he was what I should call Puritan. He was one of the last of the old Wesleyans, and one of the first of the new total abstainers. But because he belonged to the old England rather than the new, there was a certain hardiness in his prejudices and preferences. 
one of the things against which puritan that he was he had a hearty prejudice was the salutation happy christmas in his youth he said it was always a merry christmas and with one foot in the grave he considered it an impertinence to suggest that he was not still in his youth if he had lived long enough he might have seen the noble ideal of merriment even lower than the comparatively vulgar ideal of happiness the sects or heresies since his time do not make or buy or send christmas cards at all but how horrible they would be if they could be sent the theosophists as their name implies would wish us a wise christmas the pessimists between arabesques of holly and mistletoe would wish us a resigned christmas the supermen an unlucky little puritan sect would wish us all a strong christmas but then the supermen are by their nature incapable of corporate action and their tall tempestuous card full of tritons and water spouts would never be printed at all on the whole i range myself on the side of my faintly remembered forebear i am on the side of merry against happy at any rate i am very certain about one thing some persons for some reasons did call ancient england merry england no person for any reason has ever dared to call modern england happy england moreover the word happy may imply to an infinite number of levels or platforms above that of pure despair the word merry cannot be used by any people except the people in a certain pacific temperature of high spirits we may talk of people being negatively happy nobody could talk of people being negatively merry merriment is a positive victory and like most positive victories it is rare on this as on most other subjects the cynic is wrong and the cynic is most wrong when he is really a wit one cynic who is certainly a wit said be good and you will be happy but you will not have a jolly time this epigram has every intellectual merit except truth for curiously enough it is the exact opposite of the truth the psychological truth of the matter is something like this be good and you will be unhappy but you will always be capable of having a jolly time even if you have had a miserable year you may still have a merry christmas merry not happy satisfied and secure happiness does not come to him that has taken up his cross or taken up his common day's work satisfied and secure happiness comes to him who has taken up his neighbor's landmark to him who has taken bribes to him who has taken drugs most of all perhaps to him who has taken his own life solid stolid happiness is a morbid symptom it means paralysis or death or a philosophy that is worse than death in such cases the power to be happy may mean nothing more than the incapacity to be unhappy indeed it will generally be found that the impotence for tears goes along with the impotence for laughter but merry christmas is quite a different question the power of expressing not negative happiness but positive hilarity that is the thing which we all know when we see it or even when we hear it half a mile down the road it is this power of rising into the seventh heaven of mere temper the moment a strain is relaxed of being cut loose like a captive balloon or springing skyward like a released rocket that is really the reward of virtue it is not the power of saying let us feast for tomorrow we die it is the power of saying let us fast for tomorrow we feast this is the true meaning of that concentration on special days on special seasons of rejoicing which has always marked not only the highest 
of the most high-spirited societies. This is what has especially marked our own Christian European society. Our joy of life has always risen into peaks and towers and turrets, into superhuman exceptions, exceptions which really prove the rule. Our art has always been religious art, in the literal sense of being restricted and dedicated. Our poetry has always been occasional poetry, in the true sense of being written for an occasion. That is why a Merry Christmas was the right inscription, and a Happy Christmas was the beginning of our decadence. The phrase happy, in that connection, was no more than any good man should wish another for any day of his life. To tell everyone to be happy might be to make oneself responsible for a utopia, a light enterprise. But to tell everyone to be merry is to make oneself responsible for a Saturnalia, a sacred responsibility only to be undertaken once a year. End of section 13. Section 14. The Democracy of Shakespeare. I have always owed a debt of gratitude to Mr. Shaw for throwing doubts on the anti-democracy attributed to Shakespeare. The truth is that not only Shakespeare, but most of the other great poets, can only be convicted of anti-popular sentiment by the detestable habit of quoting tags. For instance, Carlyle solemnly quotes Horace about the duty of hating the profane vulgar. But Carlyle does not mention that, immediately after, Horace proclaims silence for all the world, like Whiffen the Beadle at the Eatonswill election, and announces in the best manner of modern advertisement that he has an entirely new repertoire of songs, especially suited to young people of both sexes. The atmosphere of the ode certainly is not that of the misanthropic artist. Or again, many imagine a faint oligarchic flavor about Gray's expression, far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, especially as it has been used as a title by the intensely anti-popular genius of the author of Tess of the Duberville and Jude the Obscure. A crowd more unstakably maddening than Mr. Hardy's suicidal rustics it would be hard to find in any slum. But the feeling in Gray's poem, the tone as distinct from the tag, is distinctly popular. He is praising the social strength and value of hobnailed louts, and his vision involves a noble recognition of their roughness. Though perhaps the noiseless tenor of their way is not the best description of their boots. In the same way, because somebody persuaded Shakespeare to write a rather dull play about Coriolanus, critics have talked about poor Will of Stratford, who would have often written a play about the man in the moon for the sake of a job, as if he were a rigid Roman patrician resurrected from the dead. But the general spirit of Shakespeare runs just the other way, it is founded on the popular medieval feeling that Jack is as good as his master, and often better. Whenever Shakespeare's narrative brings prince and clown together, the clown scores off the prince as systematically as Sam Weller scores off Pickwick or Sawyer or Stiggins. Hamlet and Laertes, leaping into the grave and out again, seem, and I think are meant to seem, mere theatrical sentimentalists, compared with the workman who, being as cheerful in the grave as in any other workshop, has some right to ask the grave where is its victory. Moreover, the grave digger does utter the genuine democratic sentiment, and the only important political sentiment in the play. Mr. Shaw has, by the way, truly pointed out that the man who makes the ultra-royalist speech about the divinity hedging a king is a ruffian and is killed after all. But I think the case is even stronger than he says. It must surely have been a stroke of savage humor to put the dogma that kings cannot be murdered into the mouth of the ambitious and successful gentleman 
who had the best possible private reasons for knowing that they could. The ghastly irony of the words in the mouth, not only of a usurper but of a regicide, cannot be taken as a serious salute to monarchy. But the real philosophy of democracy, right or wrong, is excellently stated by the gravedigger when he objects to great folk having continence to drown or hang themselves more than their even Christian. One could write a whole history of Europe round that phrase, even Christian. Note that broad religious views are brought in to excuse narrow social sympathies, exactly as they are today by Dean Inge and the model employees. Lertes talks a lot of new theology about churlish priests, but the man with the spade knows the truth. If this had not been a gentlewoman, this point is important, for nothing is commoner nowadays than to make sentiment the excuse when snobbishness is the motive. And when I watched the old problem plays, and when the faithful old butler bringing in the liquors heard the young genius shoot himself in the wings, or when the femme en comprise wandered down by the exquisite azaleas and disappeared into the Menterlinkian lake, something historic in me hardened my heart. And I only murmured, and the more pity that great folk should have continence in this world to drown or hang themselves more than their even Christian. The man who said that was no anti-democrat. Another difficulty is that geniuses who write unequally and have a ringing talent for melodrama, like Shakespeare, often do not get the credit for their subtlety when they are really subtle. They are credited with performing some stale mechanical trick when the trick is really too quick or new for the audience to follow it. A strong example is the other great instance of the crowd in Shakespeare, the occasion of Mark Antony's oration. The ordinary version in our Victorian youth was that Brutus made a good speech against Caesar, and the mob cheered him very much. Then Antony made a good speech for Caesar, and the crowd cheered him even more. And this was another example of Shakespeare's contempt for the inconstant populace. Now this is very bad and careless criticism. It is bad and careless, as it would be to treat Robinson Crusoe as a tale of perils, and complain that the hero had so long to fetch stores from the wreck. This would miss the point, that it is not Crusoe's insecurity, but his security that puts a silence as of a punishment about his loneliness. It is bad and careless, as it is to say, that Stevenson's tale of Jekyll and Hyde shows that a man has two natures, one good and the other evil, and that they can exist separately. This misses the point, that the interest of Jekyll is not in the success, but in the failure of his experiment. He sincerely tries to saw himself in half, but the spinal cord of conscience still connects the two parts. In other words, it is a vulgar simplification like most modern religions. It is putting down everything in black and white because you are colorblind. Antony's speech is not only sincere but passionate. I cannot prove it. Nor can you prove that Juliet was in love. That ornate blank verse is more likely to be used by a demagogue in a forum than by a girl in the balcony. There is no answer, except that there is a certain kind of blank verse that is not blank. It fills the heart of the reader, and unless we are all mad, it must have filled the heart of the writer. Mark Antony roused the democracy because he was a democrat. He was addressing the members of a democracy suddenly cowed by the coup d'etat of the old aristocrats. He was expressing himself under restrictions, but so were they. He ran great risks in saying anything, but so did they. He did not want to die very much, nor do the London poor. He had mostly to take refuge in irony, 
so do the poor. But the man who can take such irony for artificial party speaking ought to have boiling lava in his teacup at afternoon tea. His appeal throughout is to the plainest ideas of the people, death, friendship, tears, blood, money. Caesar cried at sight of suffering. Cato did not cry. Caesar had left the poor heart cash. Cassius probably would not have done so. Caesar's throat was cut, and after all, Brutus's wasn't. Antony is the professional politician, being as bold as he dares, but his appeal is to the ordinary man. And now turn back to what I think is almost the greatest thing in Shakespeare. Shakespeare's type of tragedy was the first tragedy of free will, the first Christian tragedy. Quote, unquote, we will call a halt to this business. If these words are properly spoken, the audience really feels that Duncan may have his porridge next morning in peace. It is something more living, original, and spiritual than the flattening steamroller of fate. It is the villain tempted by virtue. Shakespeare has given us one tremendous picture very much needed for these times. He has shown us the politician when he is suddenly tempted to be a man. When Antony actually finds the body of Caesar, he asks for death with startling and inspired impatience, knowing he will afterwards be a corpse or a statesman. There is no hour so fit as Caesar's death hour, nor no instrument, of half that worth as these your swords made richer with the most noble blood of all this world. Then he utters the rending phrase of Revelation, Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. Most successful statesmen have passed through that heroic instant, and there are none who do not really regret that they have survived it. G. K. Chesterton End of section 14 The Truth About Shylock it is odd that among all the eulogies, often extravagant, that have been poured out upon Shakespeare in his tercentenary year, no one seems to have noticed this point. For in this point the most extravagant and hackneyed compliments are really deserved. In this matter Shakespeare is really not for an age, but for all time. For in this matter he told something very like the eternal truth, and the truth he told has survived three quite conflicting fashions in Europe. At the end of several centuries, we seem to be coming back to it. The story of Shylock, which Shakespeare found current in his day, was a popular fable. Like many popular fables, coarse, comic, and somewhat barbarous, like most popular fables, possessed of a sharp point and a sound moral. In order to appreciate this somewhat rugged root of the thing, it is necessary to reduce to more reasonable proportions a common criticism of the poet. It is constantly said that Shakespeare disliked or despised the populace. This exaggeration is rooted in two modern ideas, both mistaken. The first is the attitude, notable in persons of sufficient vitality, which takes Elizabethans much too seriously, especially when they curse or swear. Shakespeare's few outbursts against the mob are flourishes and traditional flourishes, employed to express fleeting humors. He has not in the least the deep disdain of democracy which possessed the mind of Milton. It is not the poet outside the city denouncing the greasy citizens who will not follow him into the wilderness. It is much more likely the poet outside the tavern denouncing the greasy citizens who will not let him have a bite to eat and drink on credit. His odi profanum is a levity like his vanitus vanitatum, which Mr. Bernard Shaw has taken far too literally. The Elizabethan is playful even in his pessimism. Mr. Shaw is much more fundamentally solemn in his wildest satire than Shakespeare in his heaviest dirge. The other mistake that has mixed Shakespeare's name with the anti-popular opinions 
is his undoubted tenderness for the medieval monarchy and the divine right doctrines of richard the second but the mental association is mere historical ignorance the medieval monarchy was much more sympathetic with the populace than were the parliaments which succeeded it it was richard the second who offered to put himself at the head of the peasants henry of bolingbroke would never even have offered this he was already at the head of the lords in parliament assembled in so far as shakespeare was a royalist rather than a whig he was at one with the democracy of england shakespeare then did not seriously despise the people and he would not necessarily despise the grossness and fierceness of one of the popular tales the man who contrasted the morbidity of hamlet the prince with the good humor of the gravedigger was far from being unappreciative of the salt and virtue of the poor and in the old tale of the jew and the pound of flesh he found a primary idea which is present in all the folklore of the planet one of the great central figures upon which ten thousand tales have turned is the figure of the man who as the phrase goes is too clever by half this figure who may be called the cunning fool is found in all fairy tales and epics and anecdotes the point of him is that he gains ingeniously some abnormal power uses it logically and ruthlessly and then finds that his own logic can entrap and destroy him midas turns all he touches into gold and finds himself starving clever house obtains a charm against all leaden bullets but fails to protect himself against a silver button shylock contracts for a pound of flesh but forgets that he cannot take it without blood this is a central moral idea in all literature that simplicity often wins in the long run because subtlety becomes entangled in itself that god has often made the foolish things of the earth to confound the wise this truth being the soul of an old story its body was as grotesque and ugly as any other medieval gargoyle the man asking for his pound of flesh is a jew because in the middle ages the jew represented this relentless theory of individualistic bargaining amid a society that went much more by custom by kinship or by local loyalties the jew was to the medievals preeminently the usurer and the usurer was to them preeminently the man who made an unnatural and inhuman calculation advance at the expense of natural and human facts but while he was made a jew he was also made a ridiculous and impossible jew no attempt was made to enter into his feelings even his bad feelings he was exhibited as a vulturous old pantaloon with a hooked nose and a carving knife who at the end of the story was thrown about like a sack of potatoes the sociology of the middle ages was like its illumination and heraldry that is it was clear harmonious ingenious and significant but fixed flat absolute and in a sense conventional shylock was the usurer as the doge was the doge he had a place in a plan or pattern of colors and degrees this decorative spirit in medievalism which was its only stiffness and its only real weakness prevented any written appreciation of the psychology of the jew or the subtlety of the jewish question with admirable mental lucidity the medieval saw that the most important thing about shylock was that he was wrong but they had not the type of mental pliancy which enables one to see that a man may be wrong and yet be wronged there was much more strict justice to the jew in the middle ages than superficial modernity supposes there was a great deal of unjust favor to the jew on the part of the rulers and the rich but it is quite true that there was no sympathy with the jew he was not understood but merely flattered or bullied and disliked whether the jews were privileged aliens or persecuted aliens and they were both it is natural that such lack of sympathy should have sometimes embittered a sensitive and brilliant people and helped to harden them in that the shell of shylock in which they were so powerful and so unpopular to say that they were forced to be usurers is simply false but it is true to say that there was no encouragement in the emotional atmosphere for them widely to distinguish themselves otherwise it would i think be unfair to say that the chinese mandarins 
have seriously persecuted commercial travellers on Brighton Road. But if a commercial traveller were to try to become a Mandarin, I fear he would find himself excluded by a hundred curious Confucian obstacles. In the same way, the medieval Jew could not get into a knight's suit of armour, not so much because he was forbidden, as because the suit of armour had been made not to fit him. The civilization had been built for Christians, and nowhere would it have been so irritating to a Jew as where it was unconsciously Christian. The result for the Jew was that he had for hundreds of years a real and sincere sense of being misunderstood. The result for Christians was that they did not even try to understand him. He remained in their midst a monstrosity like the Shylock or Jernutus of the old ballad, a mad creature who objected to a slice of pork, but apparently had no objection to a slice of a man. Then Shakespeare came by, and with perhaps the greatest gesture of his life, opened up all the windows of that isolated soul. Shakespeare abolished the absurd Jew altogether, and made a mad usurer one of the most dignified and delicate of his characters. Shylock defends the pound of flesh in whole passages of passionate rationality. He appeals, as Jews do still all over Europe, to the tremendous truisms of the human brotherhood, asking whether a Jew does not bleed when he is pricked, and laugh when he is tickled. The conjunction of words is almost sinister in its suitability, for Europeans have alternately tickled the Jew and pricked him, and the same revulsion has always occurred in rotation, for while his blood was a black reproach, his laughter was always a maddening provocation. Yet this great speech of Shylock remains perhaps the finest thing ever written, finer even than Rousseau's, about the great unanswerable truth on the equality of men, the fact that every man has to die just as he has to sneeze, and that men are uncommonly alike in the presence of death, or hunger, or murder, or the multiplication table. Yet while Shakespeare thus anticipated the sincere liberalism and humanitarianism of the modern Jew, he saw in him also more ancient and uncompromising qualities. He saw, for instance, his strict domesticity, the guarding of his daughter behind curtains and doors, with a really tragic solemnity and tenderness. Above all, he realized the sensibility of the Jew, that high quivering self-respect by which he anticipates insults before they are offered, and the word dog, uttered perhaps once or accidentally, echoes again and again in his reverberant soul like the howling of numberless hounds. Now it happened that the rise of Shakespeare's glory through the 18th century coincided with the rise of republican humanitarianism, and also with the rise of the merely financial good fortune of the Jew. The red flag and the red shield happened to rise together. And though the red shield is still, in practical heraldry, charged with three golden balls, though in short the lucky Jew was still the usurer, as he had been in the Middle Ages. It became in our own time the fashion to praise all his virtues and palliate all his vices, partly through a just and general respect for his humanity, but partly also through a rather timid respect for his economic triumphs. Also, while solid Jews like Rothschild and Samuel were ruling the European market, really brilliant and creative Jews like Disraeli and LaSalle were fascinating the European mind. They generally fascinated it in the direction of very un-European things, LaSalle in the direction of socialism, Disraeli in the direction of imperialism. In this third epoch, the character of Shylock took on a new treatment. Critics and actors went to the other extreme from the medieval gargoyle. So great an actor as Sir Henry Irving acted Shylock as if he were entirely noble and almost entirely right. So fine a critic as Sir Walter Raleigh writes of Shylock as if the tale of the pound of flesh were a tiresome accident tacked on to him, as if in all other respects Shakespeare meant him as a hero and a sage. We have boxed the compass from the medievalism that could see no good in the Jew to the modernism that can see no ill in him. But Shakespeare's Shylock has remained all the time, and Shakespeare's Shylock is right. Shakespeare does not mean that Shylock is a very fine fellow, 
with a great deal to say for himself, like Macbeth. He does mean that Shylock is a man, and in many respects a good man. But he does also mean that his being a good man is seriously complicated by his being a Jew. He does mean, in other words, that he stands for a philosophy different from that of Europeans around him. As Macbeth is poisoned by the morbid notion that success is fate, so Shylock is poisoned by the morbid notion that business is business. If we could manage to be half so magnanimous and moderate as this dead Elizabethan, we might yet solve a very real problem. Something will certainly be done to the Jew. Let us pray God it may be justice. End of section 15. End of G. K. Chesterton in America, a Catholic Review of the Week by G. K. Chesterton.